Well, here we are. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the All Portable Discussion Zone. It's a bi-weekly live stream all about amateur radio and portable ops. My name is Charlie, and the call sign is November Juliet 7 Victor. And with me this evening is one of the show's two co-hosts, Brian, W7JET. And Dan is a KC7MSU, is a little bit busy tonight, so he won't be joining us. And I'm pleased to introduce to you tonight's guest, Steve, WG0AT from Colorado. <laughs> cool. Make sure you guys unmute if you haven't, and uh, we'll get going here in a minute. Of course, uh, we have everybody in chat. Thank you so much, all you guys who are listening right now live. We appreciate you being there. We're happy you're uh, joining us. And so don't forget, if you guys want to have any questions for uh, Steve at all, go ahead and ask him. We'll pop them up. Or if you have any comments, we'll try to get them up and, and uh, address them. And so with that, let's go ahead and uh, go around and just, just get caught up a little bit about what's been going on in the last couple of weeks of Ham Radio uh, Portable Ops. And let's start with Brian. Of course, he probably expected me to go with him first. So what you got going on, Brian? Well, let's see. Um, I did a very quick activation on 2-meter FM only uh, about a week ago for work, or while I was at work. Um, the road up there uh, is Worse than it's ever been, so I didn't want to spend a lot of time up there because I wasn't in my vehicle. That was uh, that. Was that. Had the uh, goat gathering yesterday, which was fantastic. It was great seeing everybody. Um, played yeah, in how the... How many do you think were there, by, by the way? I think we had about 40 people altogether. Well, that's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure we had about 40. Uh, it was a good turnout. We were missing two of the two of the goats yesterday yeah, of, all the, of all the Arizona right? goats. Yeah, we were missing only two. Um, so it was pretty, it was nice to see everybody turn out for that, and I uh, played in the uh, the sweepstakes today. Ran uh, just ran for about two hours and um, made a, made about 120, 125 contacts. Just enough to say I was in the contest for a little bit. By the way, if you're a CW person and you've never done the ARRL sweepstakes before, you should be doing it if you want to get some practice. It's a great time, a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, also uh, uh, we're gonna get a plaque, right, Brian? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. The Superstition Amateur Radio Club, WB7TJD, uh, flexed its RF muscles, and uh, we came in number one in the state of Arizona for um, for, well, for the Arizona QSO party. So, of course, it's the state of Arizona. Um, by the way, it's one of the best Arizonas, in case you didn't know that. the um, We came in number one for unlimited multi-operator high power. Um, we ran it from uh, my QTH actually with uh, with four radios and several ops throughout the day. Charlie and I pounded the key all day long, and uh, we had a really good time. Ran from eight in the morning till ten o'clock at night, so the full length of the event. And uh, it's the first time the the club has ever won anything before, so that was cool. Yeah, that was really cool. Anything oh. else, Brian? Not that I could think of, unless you can jog my memory, Charlie. No, oh, actually, no, you know, what? I did. I completely for all the. I just remembered something that happened this week. <laughs> what happened what this else? Week? What might have happened? I know. I nominated this hack CW operator for oh, yeah. CW ops earlier this week. Actually, it was, he guy's not a hack. He's a very good operator. He goes by the call sign of NJ7V, and I think he's a CW operator now. <laughs> That's right. I just I got I I was able to join the CW ops uh, group, uh, the club, uh, just a couple days ago. Yep. Uh, I don't. I think what's I don't even remember my number. It's three zero six one, right? Yes, it is. 3T6A. <laughs> it's funny. I have to ask you what it is. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for nominating me and for all those who uh, felt like I had enough skills to get in there. <laughs> you had you had a ton of, of sponsors. You had seven people on board within like seconds. I know. That was amazing. Uh, Charlie, Charlie, you're famous. You're an A-list. You're an A-list yeah. ham radio celebrity. We're D-listers, I think. <laughs> uh, no, I'm on the D-list, pal. I oh. ride your coattails. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, for me, I, the only thing I wanted to mention that uh, has been going on, I've, I've just kind of been... Uh, I've got another uh, portable paddle review coming up tomorrow evening for Monday Night Ham Radio. I have a series I'm doing, and so there's a there's a, a CW paddle series. I've I've got another one coming up tomorrow. Uh, also, uh, yesterday was just an absolutely fantastic, fun day up on the mountain. It was a drive up, so it wasn't a hike, but it was uh, the uh, North American, European, Transatlantic Summit to Summit event. And uh, did the best I've ever done, and I think it was one of my favorite activations ever. Just because of the, just because of the sheer volume of people, I had uh, two hundred and just I think two hundred and twenty nine contacts in four hours, and uh, of those, twenty were DX and six were Summit to Summit DX, and I had uh, like almost ten park to parks and twenty or fifteen or so just Summit to Summit regular ones. It was it was just a 
it was just amazing. It really was. It was wow. a good time. So that's kind of the highlight for me. Uh, let's turn it over to Steve and see what you've been up to, buddy. Yeah. Well, gosh, hearing the, the uh, audio echo back, it, it's like being a pileup almost. Uh, <laughs> So you, uh, this morning I got up and made some coffee, some really good coffee. By the way, I, I, I roast uh, green beans. I roast my own coffee beans and then grind them because it's, it's really fresh. And it ta it, the taste is a 10 D, 10 D B above what you, you know, get in the grocery store when you buy beans. Anyway, uh, the, the the sun was just starting to come up. You know, there was a time change, and I was trying to uh, go around and change clocks and this, that, and the other. And I had packed my pack last night because I was going to do a, an early morning soda. And I got out there on the deck and watched the sun start to, the light show, nature's light show take place. And I sucked my cup dry, so I had to go in and make another cup. And by the time I got out for the second cup, I almost missed the, the grand finale, and it, it was it was good. The the sun has to get underneath the clouds to light light the under underside of the clouds, so to speak. Anyway, I've, I I uh, I managed to capture a few few good snaps. But getting back to ham radio, um, I went up this morning, and uh, there was only one car in the Mount Hermon parking lot. It only holds seven cars, and. Wow. Yeah. It's and, like the uh, holy grail of parking right there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's challenging. That's, that's why I like to go early. But this morning I was late, 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 late. And anyway, I got up there and the bands were kind of strange this morning. It, you know, I mean, some chaser would call you. I mean, Gary called me on 30 meters, W0 MNA. And all of a sudden it was like he disappeared. I, I, I returned his call and he wasn't there. But finally, we hooked up, worked Martha, and um, I don't know, half a dozen stations on uh, 30. And then I jumped to 20, and, and 20 was kind of the same way, but um, no DX today, which was really surprising. That is so, surprising. You didn't work Foxtrot 4 Whiskey Bravo November today? Oh, <laughs> I mean, usually he blows my ears off. Yeah. Yes. He and um <laughs> have you caught that Indonesian station yet? Yeah. In, uh what is it? In S seven no, uh P Papa Charlie um, why, I think why it, what would you remember the call try? It's why Yan something or other. Yankee Charlie two uh, Yeah, I can't I remember. I can't remember. Yeah, he, usually, he usually sends an email afterward congratulating us congratulating us for the uh, being able to work him as yeah, I've got an email and Charlie has exactly well okay it, so uh, it, go ahead what else was there Steve? anyway it, it was it was still a fun day I, I decided to take a different route down and uh, got on some some game trails and and uh, is explored and finally got back to the truck and uh, and there was people waiting circulating around the parking lot <laughs> and it was like give me a chance take a sip of water and get my seatbelt on please they were they were they <laughs> finally pulled blood. out and two two cars tried to pull into my one spot anyway it was wow. a fun day yeah, so it is always an adventure and there's always a story for so, sure all right. Well, Steve, we have a bunch of questions lined up to ask you and uh, sure. and want to get going with that. But before we do, I hope this isn't too off track. I just thought of this as we were as we were talking. Uh, you were mentioning you, you mentioned photography. I'm not sure I know. And so if I don't know, many others don't know some of your background growing up or, or you know, in the last however many years you've been doing stuff other than other than ham radio. You you have an interest in photo photography, obviously. And, you know, maybe talk a little bit about some of your other interests, including how you became a mountaineer or, or, or are you a mountaineer? Was there a search and rescue involved <laughs> or you know what I mean? Kind of some of your background just a little. Yeah. Bit. So I grew up in Southern California on a surfboard. Yeah. Oh. And, and uh it, I mean, I, I say that really, uh, when I was, 
about 10 years old, my older brother bought me a crystal set that we had to put together. It, would, it had one transistor in it, and it was uh, had a earphone, and um, we almost burnt down my dad's bench in the garage with a solder iron. I mean, the solder in those days was this huge, you know, thing that you would solder um, a lug onto a, a, a battery terminal or something. Anyway, um, I ran around the neighborhood <clears throat> clipping on defense posts, um, downspouts, anything that was metal. And I was just, I, I was enamored with the fact that you could, you could hear um, somebody talking, music or news or whatever, um, on this little tiny, um, you know, bunch of parts that was in a plastic box. And that basically did it. I, I after that, I I kind of pursued um, electronics and um, t taking apart junk radios and hacking stuff together. And um, but somewhere along the way, I I went astray and and got into um, art and went to art school. <laughs> it was like. WTF, I mean, what are you going to do with that? And, and then I went into Uncle Sam's Army for two years, and um, the, there was, uh, at that time, Vietnam was going on, and somehow I, I managed to get, get sent to Germany for two years um, in, in the artillery and um, learned how to drink beer. <laughs> Good night. Yeah. So when I came when I came back, I, I realized that okay, what are you gonna do with an art degree anyway? And um wound up going back to uh state college and um got a degree in, in graphic design and then found the love of my life and got married and we Drove to Colorado. Actually, we drove to uh, New York and through Colorado. And when we were in Colorado, we went backpacking. And that was the high point of the trip. And went back to California and packed everything in a U-Haul trailer and hauled ass to uh, Colorado. And got a job working in a small agency in Denver. And... Um, Later, um, wound up um, spinning off from the agency with one of the uh, account executives who could sell refrigerators to Eskimos. And uh, we started our own business and uh, we were doing that for a while. And one day he approached me and said, hey, you want to buy my half of the business? And I said, which half is that? Show it to me. And he said, which half? Um, yeah, okay. Anyway, so we split up and, um, I started freelancing and it, it was during that time, all of a sudden I realized I could sell and get my own accounts. And so there was this company in Loveland, Colorado called Hewlett Packard that I started doing freelance work for him. One day they called me and said, hey guy, we, we, would you come in and talk? I want you to talk to a few engineers. And so I did. And I didn't realize at the time it was an interview and they called me back and said, hey, you want a job? And I, I said, let me think about this for a, a split second. Hell yeah. <laughs> And so, um, I mean, you know, a five or what, a great company with benefits and this, that, and the other, I thought, yeah, great. So I started working for HP as a graphic designer doing catalogs and, um, that explains how you have all these great graphics all the time. You have, <laughs> you have some experience there. Yeah. So, and guess what? There's all these ham ham radio operators that work there, 
and engineers and guys in the lab. And so when I was, you know, building these little tiny QRP radios and getting frustrated because they didn't work, I'd take it, take it in and say, find one of my buddies in the lab, and he's got this high-end spectrum analyzer and signal generator and an oscilloscope. And it's like, oh man, <laughs> we're gonna fix this thing, aren't we? <laughs> so I bought a few lunches, you know. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's kind of my short story. Okay, good. Well, good good deal. Um, what about did you have you been had any experience at all with uh, search and rescue or? Oh how, yeah. Or that how did you get involved in in the mountaineering stuff? That was another side trip. Um, part of HP's um, like I, I I think seven. Um, goals or missions or whatever anyway you know like number three besides i think number one's profit or you know creating products that are usable and profitable um but number three is is putting something back in the community and i was really getting interested in um joining uh kind of plugging back into a radio club. And so I went down to a local radio club and there was a bunch of all these old geezers sitting around the coffee pot, smoking cigarettes, eating donuts. And I said, wow, I don't think this is, this is my cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. And, and then the, the photographer that I was using at that time said, Hey, why don't, why don't you come down to a search and rescue meeting? Um, you know, we, we always need guys who are um, ham radio operators and, and fr friendly with radios and, and know how to use them and all that kind of stuff. And so I did. And the next thing I know, I'm out on a weekend doing training, wrapping off uh, a 200 foot vertical um, with a, a litter and oxygen and all this gear. And I'm just going, holy moly, what am I doing? And after a couple of years of that, um, I I really felt comfortable in the backcountry, and um, it it also felt good to to help people that had either gotten lost by no fault of their own, or um, saving somebody's life. Yeah. And so it was, and it, it kind of gets in your blood. Matter of fact, I I tried to rejoin here recently, but I had this accident. Um, about four months ago where I broke my back and that, that kind of put me out of the game because you have to be, yeah. you have be. to uh, go uphill for several hours with 35 pounds on your back, which is one of the criteria. That's, that's tough. Well, but you got to do it, right? You gotta, you gotta have people that are able to do that. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, let's dive into some more questions here. Steve, uh, thank you so much for, again, for joining us. So the first sure. question we have is we're going to ask, uh, in your opinion, what, uh, how, uh, let's see, what is portable QRP, what was the portable QRP community like pre-SODA? And, and the reason I, that's kind of what we're talking about today, right? We're, the reason I brought you on is because I know that you have been hiking mountains and doing por uh, mountaintop portable well before summits on the air existed uh and and there was you know there's there's a lot of history there and interesting things that happened before soda so uh what was uh the portable Q qrp community like uh can you just kind of describe that uh, before uh, soda very disconnected okay uh, very um, dis yeah yeah it, there wasn't uh, the web was just getting going it, um there was this uh this bulletin boards or discussion groups. And if you wanted to uh, build something or um, it, it, I was into kit building at that time. And if you wanted to, to get in touch with another ham that had a similar project or had the same kit and, you know, share your experiences, why it wasn't working or um, how to fix it. Um, there was a, a group called QRPL and it was a discussion group. And that was the hotbed of QRP. As okay. far as being on the air, um, it was 
the there was no spotting or a place where you, you could go where um, you could self spot. So um, you would go to the 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 watering holes like 14.060, which is uh, you know a a good QRP frequency. But if it was busy, you know, you'd have to slide off one way or the other. Um, usually it wasn't that busy. And it seemed like um, on weekdays, when I would go out and hike to a mountaintop or, or a mountainside uh, and break out my little ham radio gear that um, I had, radio that I just built and I was anxious to get on the air with it. Um, I'd call CQ for what seemed like hours and with no response. And when I tuned up into the, the phone band, you know, I, I would find guys, um, you know, rag chewing. And it was, um, I realized there's more fish in the ocean in, on phone than there is on CW. And that's when I, I, uh, I invested in an FT817 and I got on phone. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, so if I understand correctly then, so you have, um, you have just maybe just pockets of people. If, if, if that you just had, you were kind of out on an Island really, or maybe there's maybe you knew one or two people that did, uh, Mountaintop Portable, or did you know anybody? How, how did, did you know anybody else that didn't Mountaintop Portable uh, back then? Not, um, yeah, there was there was a military uh, pack pack group that hung around. Was it fourteen three forty two dot five? And, okay. um, and matter of fact, I when I got on phone, that's when I discovered these guys, and they were really into um, all the different. Um, military radios and one of the guys is local here um paul w0rw and um but the radio um that i, f I forget the nomenclature of it but it, it weighs like 50 pounds oh jeez! if you can imagine that thing on an alice frame pack on your back um, and it's programmable from, I think, you know, one through 30 megahertz. And, um, if you want to change frequency, you, you get, you have to take the radio off and set it down and, 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 you know, key, yeah. key, key in your frequency. But they were, they were very welcoming to me uh, in the same where are you? And I said, well, I'm on a mountaintop with a little FT817 and the, the, really a nice group of guys. It was fun yeah. kind of plugging in with them. Cool. And, and you said that uh, there was really no spotting to, to speak of. Basically, you just kind of hopped on and started calling CQ and, and hope people would find you. There was none of this uh, self-spotting stuff, right? That was it. And unless, um, you know, you you'd do a post on QRPL and then say, hey, I'm planning on going out Saturday morning and, and, you know, suggest a time. And this, I hope, hope you guys uh, can hear my peanut whistle <laughs> and give yeah. me a call if you do. And um, so. Yeah. I've heard that from other people like uh, Pete, uh, WA7 JTM. Yeah. He's been a ham since he was 13 and he's, uh, he's knocking on, knocking on the door for 70 here coming up soon. So. Uh, he's been a ham a long time. That's what he said too. He said, you know, you, you just get on and you start spinning the dial and you listen and, and you find people that way for summit to summit and you just kind of find a place and call and hope people come back. Exactly. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time coattailing um, rag chewers and just saying, hey, I'm just, you know, looking for uh, a short QSO or a signal report from you guys. Um, I'm running, you know, five watts into a piece of wire in a tree and, um, and I, I would get various signal reports and sometimes they would go well, where are you and you know really be curious about what i was running and what kind of antenna and how did i get up there and <laughs> all kinds of questions yeah 
Cool. All right. Well, let's move on here to the next question. Brian will have that one. But before we go there, uh, right here, we have a comment from uh, Jesse, actually a question. He says, can Steve show off his bearded paddle he uses in his small Altoid <laughs> tin radio? And uh, we'll, we will be getting to that at some point, right? Or do you want to do it now? Uh, go ahead and ask the next question and, and I'll try and um, find All right, it. Before, actually, okay. Yeah, actually, let's do that. Uh, there's, this, there's one other one here real quick, Steve. So there's this. If you can find that, if not, no problem. And then the other one is, uh, tell us about the goats. Uh, you know, he wants he wants to remember. So we'll we'll take an opportunity. Don't let let me forget to let's talk about the goats and let's talk about that paddle at some point. Okay. Okay, for sure. All right, go ahead, Brian. All right. So, what I want to know, t tell us about the uh, uh, your, your first. Uh, I'm sorry. Lost yeah, that's fine, there. Brian. Um, how is operating portable uh, really different now from uh, like? the 90s 2000s oh it's it's hugely different um from the standpoint that it's all about what what you can carry on your back unless you've got ghosts of course um and and so 20 years ago i was i was lugging lead acid batteries up the mountainside well, I should say that Rooster and Peanut were helping me <laughs> lug lead acid batteries up the mountainside. And and I was carrying, you know, conventional um, commercial equipment. I had an ICOM uh, 703, which was a great um, QRP radio, except it was big and bulky. Um, I mean, it had, a, you know, a separating head on the, on the front end of it, um, but still the the guts of the radio was, I don't know, probably four or five pounds. And what was the total weight you think of all your gear back then? Um, probably in the area of 30 pounds or so. I mean, I, after getting involved in search and rescue, I spent a lot of um, time thinking about, you know, what if scenarios and having to spend the night out and, you know, I'd pack a sleeping bag, pack a shelter, pack a stove you know all those things that if you're going out and, and backpacking are our standard gear um and then add the radio gear and and that's when i was packing coax and um a heavy battery and so the goats were a godsend um it was it was a lot of fun too i just because they were they're <laughs> They're comedians. I mean, they're just goofy. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's what that's what got me into you know doing the videos because I, I I've got to share this. <laughs> and uh, so and so the 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 big thing was weight and um, functional gear that was designed for being outdoors and it, it, you. You look, at, you look at the transition from that point in time to today, and there's there's a myriad of equipment that has front facing panels that when you set the radio on the on the ground, the the, the front panel is facing you or tilted up and facing you, and it's lightweight, and you've got batteries, these lipo batteries that are lightweight and the radios um don't drink a lot of current uh, there's uh it, it took i think a lot of um user feedback to some of the manufacturers to say you know hey <laughs> i don't want a radio that that, that requires one amp on receive <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right, Steve, well, tell us about your first uh, mountaintop portable excursion that you can remember. First time you were on a mountain with a ham radio. Wow. Can you remember? Um, if you can't remember, no big deal. But Yeah, well, you know, what got me into it was I saw it, in a, and there's a picture, I think, in that either that of W7ZOI and his team in 1967. They were on Mount Baker. And they they carried a uh, a lead acid battery up motorcycle lead acid battery up there, 
Wes Hayward, W7ZOI, was an engineer at Tech Tektronics in Oregon and designed and built a um, a receiver that he he put in a ARC-5 um, surplus uh, re receiver, ARC-5, that ran on, on 12 volts. And then he also built a companion crystal controlled transmitter and they ran field day up there. There was, a, I think, a group of five of them. And uh, I saw that and I thought, how cool is that? I could do that. And that was in 67. It was prior to my tour with uh, Uncle Sam in Germany. And so when I came back, um, he had developed that further and had there was printed circuit boards for it. And I, I managed to get a hold of one of those and I, I built it. And uh, I t took it up on a mountainside with a, a ham buddy and uh, <laughs> we spent the night and um, it was just a lot of fun. We we made a bunch of contacts and um, wow. played played in full in field day with it. And um, and it was after that I got involved in FYBO Freeze Your Butt Off, which is a contest where you get uh, points for um, you get a multiplier for the temperature that you're operating at. And, I went up on a mountaintop. Actually, it wasn't a, a mountaintop. It was more like a hill. And um, but it was it was bitter cold. It was like ten degrees. And um, I operated, and I probably made I don't know a dozen contacts. And I turned turned my score in, and I quote unquote I won uh, for the zero district and i thought wow <laughs> am i the only idiot this that, that went out and played in that freezing weather <laughs> when was this so you said late 60s um no this was uh mid 70s okay mid 70s yeah so i along the way i i built you know hw8 and uh several other an hw7 then i moved on the hw8 and uh, use that a lot, but still, you know, like that's two and a half pounds of radio that you're that Rooster's carrying on, you know, on his back. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, Brian, you're up. Sorry, I was having trouble with the cough button here. I'm still getting over my little uh, allergy this week, oh. so I got a little faster on the mute button. Otherwise, I'd be interrupting you with QRM you know, from uh, from here. So what which antennas have you used on uh, uh, summits most often? Yeah, well, I started out with dipoles, and I that's when I realized coax is really pretty heavy heavy stuff. I mean, I transitioned to RG58 and then I, I transitioned to uh, RG174, but I don't know. There was, I heard a lot of guys, particularly engineers at work were telling me that RG174 is, is lossy. And, you know, running QRP when you're only pumping in three, four watts, five watts at the most at one end. Um, you want as much as of that power to make it to the antenna. So I started investigating uh, amphid halfways. Bingo, you don't have to carry coax. You just feed the end of, end of the wire. But there's a problem. It looks like 3,000 to 5,000 ohms and the transmitter wants to see 50 ohms, so you got to you got to transform that down to something that keeps the radio happy, and, and you don't blow your finals out. But it, thankfully, the internet um, and and searching uh, provided a 
you know, schematic and I played around with different toroids and, and now it's, uh, you know, NFID halfways are ubiquitous. It's like you can buy kits or you can, you can buy a ready-made antenna. And it's, um, I think that that has really helped with, um, the packability of or lightweightness of, of the antenna system, plus the batteries and, um, lightweight radios it's it's you know made uh soda and poda you know a joy just plug and play cool all right um let's see the next question is have uh you have various homebrew cw keys what's your favorite homebrew uh key and why yeah um i had a couple of pico pedals actually i had a uh, a palm paddle that i started with and then i saw the the pico paddle come out and i got one of those and you know they're they're really solid they're adjustable they're lightweight um a nice form factor the fact that they kind of pop back into themselves for for transport and that kind of thing it was a great key and i was really sorry to see see them um disappear but there's a lot of alternatives that have kind of popped up with you know 3d printing and whatnot and then i got i i bought one of uh i think it's wa5 pyy or i, I forget his call sign but he came out with a uh, a paddle that was based on burling beryllium um spring clips that are used in the back of, of computer panels for grounding would that, would that be the teeny key is that the one you're talking about teeny key you're right and there's a, a group in michigan that's picked it up and they're still making them yep i just got one ah and so i researched i, I thought well it'd be interesting to see if i could make one of those and so i researched on the on the web and of course ebay had strips of um the the beryllium grounding lugs or finger stock as they call it and um so i made a couple of paddles and they worked and um and i it was i i like to i've got several qrp radios and i like to to kind of make a kit for each one of those that has you know headphones it has a key it has a battery it has an antenna and it's, it's ready to go and um and that's also how i sometimes get bit because i realize after i got up on the mountain oh yeah i didn't charge the battery the last time i used it or i left a connector um or no headphones <laughs> So is this, this there you go. One? Yeah, yeah, that's one of those. That's actually that's one of my first ones. OK, and the piece of wood I found on on a uh, soda summit and I sanded it down and. And uh, and then I drilled it out with a long drill so that I could get the cable, you know, pass through it. And basically the the, the brass uh, acorn nut is ground and then. Um, the Ber Berlin, the finger spring, stock. finger stock, which is is very springy, and you press it, you know, with your finger, and it pushes and makes makes contact with a, the ground uh, piece, it but it returns back to its original position. Yeah, it's there's a, another one, and so it's it's. Uh, I don't know. It, it, they're easy to make. They're, and this is my uh, uh, capacitive uh, touch paddle that I made for my mountain goat mountain or mountain goat activation. And um, <laughs> it's a, a vertebrae, an elk vertebrae. And um, I, I showed it to my friend Steve, K7PX, and he looked at it and he says, hey, that that thing needs some horns. <laughs> and, and so he had a, a shed laying underneath his bench of a um, a, uh, a buck, a yearling buck who he cut off the horns, 
and got the hot glue gun out and and we stuck them on on <laughs> the, the the head of this uh supposed uh goat pedal and and then we used a marker to, to black them out make them look like like uh you know a mountain goat and anyway you those those are upholstery tacks or upholstery um yeah, tax. And you touch you touch the eyes, and it's capacitive. There's a PC board inside the the skeleton, so to speak. And only problem was I didn't test it out before I get up on the mountain. And um, <laughs> when I started using it with the Enfit half wave antenna, it RF just locked the thing up, and so I had to put. Um, I used use some some chokes in the in the the line that goes to the radio, and it worked. Of course, that was after after the fact when I got home. And all right, what else do we have, Brian? <laughs> Sorry, mute button. <laughs> <laughs> So what what's your most memorable DX from a summit? Oh wow! Yeah, they're actually they're you know, said L one BYC John called me one time when it was later in the day via the gray line and just. Blew my mind. I was I was about ready to cash it in, and uh, you know, New Zealand. It was just amazing. But lately, it seems like you know band conditions are starting to improve, and there's there's Chris F four WBN. There's um, Lars uh, SA5 B or SA4 BLM from Sweden. And I don't know, I, my, my memory is not that good, but there's, there's a whole slew of Europeans that um, chime in nowadays. And it's just, you know, it, it makes you smile all the way back to the trailhead, thinking about all the DX that you worked that day. And but there's also been a lot of uh, great kind of fun QSOs that I've I've had. I think there's a folder or some of those photos read. Yeah, um, you remember what email that is? Which which number? Uh, it's either five or six, or maybe it might be. Yeah. Four. Let's, let's, let's I think I labeled it. Great QSOs. Anyway, the uh, I was on. Mount Hermon, and I, this was before Soda, and I had made a bunch of contacts across the U.S., and I was just getting ready to pull the plug, and this voice comes out of the noise, K, KL1HB, Alaska. And I looked at Peanut, and Peanut looked at me, and I said, did you hear that? Matter of fact, I made a video out of it. And yeah, there he is. He sent me a QSL card. And on, on the QSL card, on the back side of it, it says, um, great work QRP to Alaska. I could see your smile during the QSO. And, <laughs> and I was smiling from ear to ear, man, because it was just like, Wow. Anyway, cool. there's. Anyway, I was at Dayton one year in the buddy pole booth helping uh, buddy pole guys, and he walked up to me and said, "Hey, you're the. Your old call is N zero T U, right?" And I said, "Yeah," and he said, "Yeah, I remember." And it was it was great to meet the guy that I talked to um, firsthand and and get a picture with him. Yeah, 
cool. All right. So the next, uh, I guess, I don't know how to handle this exactly. So let me just set it up here. So um, pre summits on the air, there were still incentives or programs that you could participate Events, yeah. in uh, to you know get on the air. Can you talk about some of them? I, I mentioned earlier when I was talking to you an email, uh, two or three of them. I think they're one of. I, I uh, know about most of them, but uh, there's the well. Why don't you just mention the ones you can think of? Yeah, well, there was um, Bob K Zero NR had started uh, the Fourteener event probably about twenty years ago, and, and there was um, there was a Fourteener event which only unfortunately was once a year, and the whole idea was you know that Fourteeners would communicate back and forth to each other. Um, my friend N Seven UN guy and I decided, well, let's do something on HF. And so we got a special event call sign, N0 Bravo, N0B. And we used the goats to haul a bunch of HF gear up and set set up a, a big antenna on um, Mount Humboldt. And, and we, you know, tried to publicize it as much as possible and, and, uh, made a bunch of contacts and um it was fun we base when camped about pardon me when was this uh, i'm gonna say eight late 80s early 90s okay somewhere cool. in there and um we base camped and then got up early and and hiked up and and operated most of the day and then we also did VHF to include, uh, you know, all the, the VHF stations that were on other 14ers. Um, but there's other other events, too, like uh, Freeze Your Butt Off, which was the polar bear group that um, <laughs> their, ex their exchange was, was basically, you know, RST temperature and their greeting, which was uh, grrrr. So did um, you send that on via CW? Yeah, G R R R R R R. <laughs> Over CW, that's funny. Yeah, the polar bear group, huh? Yeah. Did they? They did something like a moonlight madness or something like that. Yeah, they did. It was. Uh, it was to you know get get them out at night and get on the air. Um, so yeah. it was kind of like a sort of like summits on the air, right? Because you had a whole bunch of people just getting out all at once on the same on the different summits to work each other. Exactly. Well, it, it was, you know, to get out somewhere um, where it was cold because uh, you wanted a good um, temperature number. And, and they also assigned numbers like, you know, clubs or, or events where they, they assign a number of um, you have to contact them and they'll give you a number. So you exchange numbers. My polar bear number was the temperature at which water freezes, number 32. Yeah. <laughs> so, and there was, um, yeah, and and there's a Spartan Sprint event, which. Yeah, what's uh, that? I don't know about that one. So I know a little bit about the polar bear event. I've actually been in correspondence with the guy from the polar right. bear event, and he said it's kind of died. I want to get it going again. I actually want to maybe do something in conjunction with the summits on the air and do like a polar bear special <laughs> summits on the air thing, but we'll see what he says. I mean, I'm still trying to get going on that, but yeah, this, the Spartan sprint, I have no idea what that is at all. Yeah. That, that goes off once a month. Um, it's the first Monday of a month and it's still a, a going thing. Uh, Richard, gosh, if I can remember his call sign, I'll, I'll follow up in an email with, and, um, see if I can connect some of these events with names and call signs. Yeah, send it but, to me, and I'll put it in the in the uh, notes below. Okay. And um, but the Spartan Sprint event, it again is it it's a uh, it's just an exchange of uh, you know see how many contacts you can make, and also it's an opportunity to to kind of see how how low you can go in terms of QRP and still make contacts. Uh, depending upon conditions and bands and, and your antenna, um, it, and it 
also there's uh, multiplier points for being portable. In other words, setting up in your backyard or a local park or whatever. And it, it's just kind of a, a reunion of a bunch of friendly QR peers and uh, a way to get on and, and launch some RF. Okay. So that's, and that's, a, I don't know if that's still going on or not, but that was a, a once a month thing, huh? Right. Yeah. It's still going on. Okay. I don't know much. What's the exchange or is there one? Uh, it's usually, um, it's CQSP for Spartan and the exchange is, is name, state, um, RST, RST name, state. And in power. Okay. And so if, if you, you try to go as low as you can and still make a contact then, huh? Well, that's, you know, that's one of the things you can do. Um, but some guys just go ahead and run, you know, whatever power the rig runs up to maybe five watts, 10 watts, whatever. Yeah. And it's so, mostly, mostly CW. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly Morse code. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Let's see. The only other one was freeze your butt off, which is, a uh, I'm actually a member of that uh, Scorpions Club that does that. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, th there's something I wanted to, you to mention in this one because it's very interesting. For the freeze your butt off event one year, you did something kind of interesting. I think. Did you have a picture of that, by the way? The, the, the... oh yeah, I built a, a snow cave. Yeah. And um, being in search and rescue, you know, the, there's like training every other weekend. And one of the, one of the trainings was building a snow cave and, or snow shelters. And so I, I got pretty confident at, at that. And we had a, a Thanksgiving snow um, that was like a couple of feet. And so I got the snow shovel out and in, in the backyard, um, I mean, my backyard's huge. I live on 10 acres. So I, I started scraping all the snow together and it created a big pile and I, I dug this snow cave and um, it was big enough that I could sleep in it. And that was another time where I, I made a QSO with a guy in the Caribbean and he's, he said, you know, I, I, just, I described to him where I was operating from. I'm in a snow cave in my backyard operating um qrp with my little he this was on voice and um he said well i'm i'm sitting on a beach with an umbrella drink watching the bikinis walk by <laughs> quite a contrast <laughs> yeah no kidding funny all right. Well, um, we're at five fifty-four, five fifty-five. Um, let me just ask Brian and Steve real quick. Brian, are you able to stay longer, or do you got to hop off if we go another fifteen? Um, I could probably stay a little longer. I haven't heard the uh, the dinner bell ring yet, but I know food okay. is cooking. Let us know when it is. Uh, Steve, what about you? Could you stay another fifteen minutes? Yeah. Um, Yellowstone. Um, start the uh, Yellowstone series starts up, and my wa wife is—I'm sure she's recording it, so okay. she can she can wind it back for me and blast okay. through it without the commercials. Okay, because we're almost through some uh, most of the questions we had for you. So let's sure. let's let Brian take take another one and see where we get. All right, cough button is off. Um, <laughs> so, what about the? Um, so you like to cook on the summits. Why do you do it? And uh, why do you think others should try? Well, it's, it, it, it's really nice to be able to have a hot cup of tea. I mean, for a long time, I've, I've carried a thermos with me and that's, that's, you know, an extra two pounds of weight, but it's uh, to have hot coffee or hot tea on a summit particularly in the winter time is just a godsend and it's 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 morally uh inspiring and it's nourishing and uh you know it just makes a pile up go faster um but i've used um probably 10 15 years ago when i when was my lightweight ultra lightweight phase of gear i started making alcohol, alcohol pop can stoves 
and I was with a buddy and we were up on a, uh, a snow adventure pulling a sled and in cross country skiing. And uh, I <laughs> made the mistake of heating some water inside the tent and he woke up and flipped his sleeping bag over on top of the stove and knocked it over. And problem with alcohol stoves, you can't see the flame. All of a sudden, I, I looked down and I realized the floor of the, t the tent was melting. And I grabbed the stove and threw it outside the door. And But the whole, whole floor was ruined at that point. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no. And at least you had, caught it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we we snuffed it out with, uh, you know, the, a sleeping pad. Yeah, but it, right. it it was about 100 bucks to get the floor replaced. It was a VE24, um, I don't know, I think it's like a three-man tent, but. Wow. All right, well, yeah, I, I know I was taking this first aid, uh, wilderness first aid class, and they were talking about how when you're in cold weather, you got to, you got to keep warm and, and you got to stoke the stove, so to speak. And that's your, your, fi your, your fire, right? Inside exactly. You. So exactly. You to, so when you're up in the cold weather, up on top of the mountain, you, and when you're on high altitude that you need more, more energy also. So you got to give your body the energy it needs. So I can see why you'd want to cook something. But it's, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, or at least now I'm trying to kind of get down to a minimal kit that will still, you know, produce a hot cup of Joe or a soup or whatever, but um, not be dangerous or a uh, potential fire hazard. Um, and, and, and you know, get up on a summit, it's always windy. And I'm still trying to refine the, the uh, cooking apparatus, if you will. Yeah. All right. Well, I got a question here from somebody he says, uh, what is Steve's current goat status? Do you, do you know what it is? By chance, do you keep track still? Goat status? Yeah, yeah I guess I'm, your activation I'm, points. I'm sneaking up on um, 3x goat. Ooh, but nice. it's you know the the, uh, the the derailment here this last summer when I broke my back is is kind of slowed me down and uh, it you know and it it also with COVID. Um, and, you know, staying in place and, um, not traveling as much. Um, I said, heck with that. I'm, I'm just going to go operate Mount Hermon. So 2020, <laughs> I operated Mount Hermon, um, two or three times a week. Matter of fact, it was 60 times that year that I, I, are you kidding? Uh, you, you activated Hermon 60 times. Yeah. Wow. You know. The, okay, so I only got points for it for one time, but every time I, I hiked that thing and, and got on and heard the pile up, I said, that's all the points I need. <laughs> all right. He says he actually, he do you have goats still? He says, I mean, his actual goats, Bob. Do you, do you have any goats still? Yeah, Boo Goat is, uh, well, regretfully, Peanut and Rooster have passed on. They've just gone up the trail ahead of me. They're waiting for me. And um, Boo Goat is now the 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 one living goat that gets out once in a while with me. He, unfortunately, he I got him when he was about three years old, and he's not bonded to me as well as Rooster and Peanut were. And we get up on a mountaintop, and if it's a, a you know a fairly public uh, summit where there's a lot of people. Boo is, he's a loose cannon. He goes around and, and flashes his big goat eyes at people thinking that he'll get a treat. And, <laughs> and he, he's, you know, I, I, I either have to tie him up or uh, be hang, hanging on to his collar. The problem is he weighs 230 pounds. That's a hundred more pounds than I do. I weigh. And so, you know, he'll drag me off if, unless I'm, you know, sitting down or tie, tie him off to a tree or something. Yeah. 
Let's see, Dan AI six or XG <laughs> said he, he one of his highlights is back. There's a he made a comment earlier about his highlight being uh, a joint activation. Obviously, you know him. Here it is, right here. Tell Steve's it, highlight of soda experiences. Yeah, yeah. He 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 was in the neighborhood, so we we uh, joined up and went up on Herman, and uh, it was a fun activation. Yeah, Dan's a good guy. He is. Yeah, I know him pretty good too. I haven't met him yet, but I know him through uh, through other ways. Uh, so we have two more, a little bit more time. I, we probably have ten more minutes. Let's go maybe two more questions, one more each. I'll ask one, and then and then uh, Brian will ask one, and then we'll wrap up with any other questions there might be in chat and call it good. So uh, mine is: Do you have a summit in another state or country that is on your soda bucket list? Wow. Um. I did Hawaii when wife and I went over there for our uh, one of our wedding anniversaries, and um, it you know it's it's just fun to to I I don't particularly have anything on my bucket list. It would be fun to to get to Europe one of these days, and um, possibly activate some summits over there. Meet up with some of the activators. But every time I get to a new state, you know. If it's something I plan ahead of time, um, making contact with the activators in that state and um, asking, you know, what are some of the more fun summits or would you be available to uh, accompany me? Um, it seems like I'm I'm kind of the ambassador for Mount Hermon, but <laughs> you probably are. Yeah. Have you have you had any activations in Arizona by chance? I did get down there with. Uh, Actually, KT5X Fred. Okay. And myself, and we went down. Fred did a, we did a joint presentation for, uh, was it in Phoenix? Okay. There's there's a lot of clubs in Phoenix. So yeah, yeah. you probably did. Yeah. And I brought the goats down. And actually, the goat, there was a grassy area outside the back of the, it was uh, Veterans of Foreign War um, Club, and yeah. the goats were out back, and um, there was a gal that said that she would watch them. Well, when I turned around and walked back in, the goats came back in with me, <laughs> and the bartender said, those goats can't be in here. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. All right, uh, Brian, you have any other thing you want, anything else you want to ask, and then we'll oh. open up the chat. I was going to ask about, uh, like, what's your best, like, non-ham radio person encounter up on a summit? So somebody like Charlie and I, on his first activation, had one that was very memorable. Curious if you got something like that. Yeah. Um, I was on, let's see. can't remember the, the name of the summit. But anyway, uh, there, there was a, a hiking group that came up and this one lady walked over and she spoke broken English and actually she was Russian and um, said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm a ham radio operator and her eyes lit up like, you know, I said, do you know what that is? And she said, yeah, my dad is a ham radio operator. His call sign is you are five question mark, question mark. And she said, every Thanksgiving or every holiday, I don't know if they do Thanksgiving in Russia, but every holiday the family gets together, my dad um, invites everybody into the radio room and he makes contacts with all these people all over the world. And it's just really neat. It's, it's such a neat hobby. And, um, and that, that was, that was probably the most unusual one I've had. Uh, most of the time people come up to me and say, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm talking to a guy in New York right now, uh, with Morris code. And, um, they pull out their cell phone and say, well, I can do that. And I, <laughs> yeah. and I say, well, I don't pay anything for it. I don't have a carrier for ham radio. 
um, and, and plus I've, I've built this radio with my own two hands and um, using Morse code is a whole different language, which uh, goes farther than, than voice. And anyway, it, 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 it there's, but it's fun to be ham radio ambassador and, and thanks to Stuart and his, uh, his card, there's probably a, a, a photo. I forget which. Yeah. I'll public, see if I can find it and bring it up. Public encounters. Home. Anyway, I, I came up with my own card that says, so what am I doing? And, uh, you know, I explain, there's a paragraph of text that explains I'm hammer radio operator. I, I'm into hiking. And on the flip side of the card is what is soda? Or what is summits on the air? Yeah, here's. You want to go okay. back one? No, right that, here? Yeah, that's that's the card that Stuart came up with. It, it was in his book, um, Portable Operating. Yep, there you go. And and this is a good book, by the way. ARL has it. Anyway, um, I saw Stuart's card and I thought, that's cool. I need that because. If you're on a summit and you're operating, unless you're with um, a buddy and you're both, you know, one guy's operating or taking turns, one guy's operating, the other guy's kind of just standing around eating his lunch or uh, um, trying to keep the goat from running off. And somebody walks up and says, what are you guys doing? Then one guy can be the ham radio ambassador. But. I can reach in my uh, pack pocket and pull this out if I'm still operating and don't want to, you know, stall the pile, um, hand it to him. And then at a convenient point, I can, I can turn off the, the radio or tell him to stand by, you know, red answer attacking or whatever. And, <laughs> um, and talk to the, pedestrian or hiker and explain what ham radio is and, and, and be a, a good ambassador for a ham radio. Yeah. Cool. All right. I think we should probably wrap it up now here. We've been going a little over an hour. Uh, Steve, thank you. Um, one last thing I want to try to just give you the floor, uh, open-ended question. You, you have been, uh, as you can tell from the chat, I mean, the, the number of people that have, have mentioned how how influential you have been in, in their choices for summits on the air and, and how inspiring you've been, uh, there, you've affected so, so many people just by your example. Uh, it's true. It is, including myself. I mean, there's just so many of us that look up to you. So uh, what would you say is uh, something that you would you would tell them or anybody trying to get into the hobby or just generally speaking, just open up the floor and just give you a few minutes to say whatever else you want. <laughs> wow. Um, be curious. I mean, I was an art major and I had no idea of how the rabbits run around in a circuit. And as my friend Bob tells me, K0NR, he says, those aren't rabbits, they're electrons. And, um, but I built a radio from scratch. Um, I got a schematic, I got the components, and it, it, it was, um, it, actually it was fairly easy to build because it was, you build one section at a time and get that each section work, working. First one was the audio section and it was pretty easy to, you know, figure out how to get that to go. But, um, and if you don't understand something, ask another ham. Um, we're all in this together. <laughs> and my experience has been most hams are willing to share and um, kind of bring you along. And, um, and as far as some of us on the air, you know, it's it's like um, I've had some people contact me and say, "Hey, I'd like to go with you sometime," and that's the way to do it. Is is as far as the events go, and it's the same thing with CW. You know, it, there's a, a, a lot of programs now, um, CW Academy, and um, some other groups that um, will invite you in and um, 
help you with the code. And then it's all, all about getting on the air though and, and communicating. That's the beauty of this hobby is we get to talk to other human, other human beings and make contact and all over the world and find out about their equipment, their family, their weather, their, what they do for a living. Yeah. It's a great hobby. It is. I couldn't agree more. All right, Steve, I'm going to uh, give Brian another minute or two if he has anything <laughs> else he wants, and then I'll, and then I'll say goodbye to you. I'm unmuted. All right, cool. I was actually just going to share a, a quick photo of some uh, handsome looking people that just came through on my, uh, on my email. So let me, uh, let me get that up here. A little from yesterday. Let's see, share a screen. Share a screen. This one. Boom. Are we seeing it? There it is. So that is the, uh, the goat crew from Arizona yesterday. We're only missing two. So that represents all the all mountain right. goats in Arizona. You got, I'm sure you, you, how many of these guys do you actually know who they are? Are there, Steve? I can, I can introduce you to them all. Yeah, I, I see uh, K, KR7RK in the back row there. It, is that Paul? Um, yep, all the way on the far right there. Yep, the bald guy. All right, he's back. He, he's back. He is. Awesome. He is back. Yep, we've got Lynn, one of our, our uh, female uh, goats. Um, can you, excellent. Can you can zoom in just a little, maybe? Yeah, yeah let me possible. try it. Hold on. Let me try that out there. That better? Yeah, that's put my glasses back on. There Check we go. Now you, there you go. Now everybody's zoomed in. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so Lynn K, um, HPX, uh, so K some guy in the middle, yeah. Ch Charlie. Yes. Well, these the, you know these two here, the the, the two in front, the 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 couple is K six HPX and uh, KB seven. What is hers? What's K, what's the K, K's? H, K, K, HBM or something like that. They're a, yeah, they, yeah. She, yeah, she's a Kate. I've worked for her a couple of times. Yeah, yep. she's a, a triple goat and he's a quadruple goat. And they're right. they're still going. You got uh, Ray USA Excellent. there. You got uh, Pete JTM. Um, <laughs> Robert N3BZ. Behind him, you've got uh, Chris from <laughs> TAB. Um, Lee and seven LP. So yeah, this is all but two of the Arizona goats. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. <laughs> cool. All, all right. right. Thanks all for right. sharing that. All right. Uh, <laughs> I guess with that, Steve, <clears throat> we are going to say goodbye to you. Uh, excellent, uh, interview and appreciate you coming on, uh, open invitation on my end as well, Steve, anytime you're in Arizona, I'll take you on a mountain wherever you want to go. So, <laughs> Likewise, right. I appreciate it, guys. And, and hey, this has been fun. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I rambled on too long. Um, no, this is perfect. No, it, I didn't. Uh, uh, it's, it's been a real joy, and that's, that's what <laughs> I. This hobby has inspired me in such a way that it's just fun to inspire others. And share the joy because it's it's been the joy of my life and i can't wait to get up another morning at 5 a.m and go climb mount herman and uh get get this back in shape so i can go off and uh do some more uh adventurous peaks cool all right all right so, guys 73s and thanks yeah. bye steve